Good morning to everybody. First of all, I would like to thanks Luis for this invitation. It's a great pleasure and of course of, uh, an honor for me to be here this morning and to present you this uh, topic, the circle of Willis, historical review and evolution of concepts. First of all, a few words about Thomas Willis. He was born in 1621 and he was an English physician, scientist, pioneer in research. He was professor of nature philosophy at Oxford, a founding member of the Royal Society and one of the Royal Physicians of Charles I of England. During his scientific work, he was credited to be one of the first physicians to use the term neurology. He was among the first to present the notion of a circulating hormone from the pituitary gland. He renamed and described the cranial nerves, and by the way, actually we are using something that is very close to this, his description. Uh, he, was the, uh, he made the first modern description of the blood supply of the spinal cord. He described the corpora striata and the optic thalami. He was the first that named the annular protuberance and the white, uh, the white mammillary eminence behind the infundibulum. He recognized the separate identity of the basal ganglia, and he was the first to describe the medullary pyramids. This is uh, his great um, scientific work named Anatomy of the Brain with a description of the nerves and their function. And in uh, this book, uh, it, uh, published in 1664, he described the circle uh, on the base of the brain that will be named later Circle of Willis. The description of this circle uh, may be found, that may be found is there may be a main fault way for the blood about to go into diverse regions of the brain so that if by chance one or two should stop, there might be easy be found another passage instead of them. So as you can see here, we can find not only a description of the full anatomical structures, but also a very good uh, proposition for the physiological function of the circle of Willis. But uh, what was the historical perspective in this, uh, in the historical moment uh, when this um, important uh, discovery was made? First of all, the English, um, this was the end of the English Civil War, uh, where the royalists fighting against the parliamentarians. And uh, this um, was uh, after the recurrence of the plague known as the Second Plague Pandemic and the Great Plague of London. So, as you may imagine, this were a quite difficult time for making scientific work. But probably the most important challenge for Willis was the Galenic doctrine in medicine and anatomy. Who was Galen? Claudius Galen, uh, known also as Galen of Pergamon, was a prominent Greek physician, surgeon, and philosopher. Uh, he, uh, he was a follower of Hippocrates' do doctrine for the four humors. Uh, basically, the, the doctrine of Galen was so strong that it influenced the Western medicine for more than 1,300 uh, 1, years. So you can imagine this is a very long period. The problem was that part of this doctrine was not really close to our contemporary um, idea about anatomy and uh, about the things, uh, how, the, how the physiology of our body is um, working. So the basic of this doctrine was that the circulatory system consists of two separate one-way systems of distribution. That the venous blood is generated in the liver that the arterial blood is originated in the, heart, in the heart and was distributed from there, that the blood goes back and forth from the heart in an ebb and flow motion, and that the heart is a producer of heat. So you can imagine this is quite difficult to fight with this type of doctrine, and uh, uh, this, is, was, uh, this was one of the main challenges uh, that Willis has to overcome. What are the scientific, uh, important scientific personalities that uh, uh, was fighting against this doctrine? First of all, we have to mention the Arab physician Abn al-Nafis, born in 2013 in Damascus. In his book, Co Commentary on Anatomy in Avicenna's Canon, he postulated, the blood from the right chamber must follow through the vena arteriosa or the pulmonary artery to the lung, 
spread to its substance, pass through the arterio venosa or the pulmonary vein to reach the left chamber of the heart. This was one of the first and earliest description of the pulmonary circulation. Uh, we cannot, uh, we have to mention also the Leonardo's anat anatomic drawing and one of the probably most important anatomists uh, in the history of medicine, Andreas Vesalius, who published, uh, published in 1543 his great work, uh, The Human Corporis Fabrica, The Structure of the Human Body. Regarding the circulation, uh, the name that have to be mentioned is uh, Williams Harvey. He was an English physician that found out that the heart worked as a pump. This is a completely new notion, something, com let's say, even revolutionary in the concept, concept of understanding how uh, our, um, how our ca cardiopulmonary system works. So his idea was that the bliss do not drift in the body in any sort of random ebb and flow, but it is pumped endlessly around a very precise circuit. Circuit. He published in 1628 um, and provided one of the greatest breakthroughs in the understanding of our human body. This is the book that he published. Regarding the circle of Willis, uh, Willis was not the first to make investigation on this part of the uh, cerebral circulation. There are many scientists uh, like um, Gabriel Fallopius, Julius Cesario, Johan Wessling, and uh, Jan Weffer that makes studies in this direction. But no one of them could describe the whole circle. No one of them could make a uh, reasonable proposition about the function of this circle. Or, uh, and no one of them made a really um, a viable and good illustration of this circle. So uh, Willis was the first to do all of this in one and only one book and work, scientific work. What were the key points for the success of Willis? First of all, he used a different method of dissection. And uh, he was very uh, skillful in this work. And um, the pre pre before him, previous anatomists approached the brain uh, in situ. Uh, so they made a dissection after opening the vault and sliced the brain without removing it. So he was one of the first to remove the brain before making a, dis a dissection. And this, of course, gave him a very good view about the basal structures that were not so visible uh, with the previous method of dissection. The other important part is that he had a very, uh, very good collaborators and he, he um, made a marvelous illustration that were prepared by Sir Christopher Wren. Probably we have, you have heard the name of Christopher Wren because he was uh, one of the most acclaimed uh, architects in uh, England and uh, particularly in London. He was re responsible for the building of 52 churches and by the way also the St. Paul's Cathedral. So he was a very prominent architect but before that he was working with Willis and made his illustration. You can imagine how important uh, high quality illustration in this type uh, was uh, how, how important it was to have someone with good um, uh, skills in this uh, field. The other important point is, is the intravenous injection. In 1650, once again, Wren inve uh, invented the intravenous venous injection. Later, uh, this was developed as a main instrument for inter intravenous infusion. But during that period, Wren injected ink in the venous system of dogs, and uh, this method permitted him to follow the, the blood vessels in a very different manner. This, is, this was also a breakthrough step. So finally, Thomas Willis was the first to describe the circle and to present the first realistic high quality illustration. And he was the first to recognize the physiologic significance and importance of the circle in maintaining the collateral flow of the brain. Uh, in 1774, Albertus von Haller, in his bio, uh, bio, Biblioteca Anatomica, Biblioteca Anatomica, was the first to attach the name of Willis to the circle on the base of the brain. Subsequently, Circle of Willis gained popularity and became a commonly used eponymous name. If you go further in the history and uh, we look for the different methods of investigation of the circle Willis, of Willis, we have to mention Agas Monitz, uh, 
Uh, he was a Portuguese neurologist, one of the founder of the modern psychosurgery, uh, who received in a Nobel Prize in 1949, and he was uh, the scientist who developed the cerebral angiography. This was a completely new method for investigation of the, uh, of the um, vessels of the brain, and particularly of the circle of Willis. We have also to mention uh, Santiago Raimon Cajal, uh, Dorca Page, uh, who made a lot of thorough study in, the, in neuroembryology. So uh, they gave us a completely new view of the development of the Circle of Willis that can be illustrated in different books. And here you can find the evolution, um, some illustration of the evolution of the, of the circula, brain, brain circulation, in particular of the uh, evol evolution of the circle of Willis during the uh, embryological period. A uh, completely different point of view gave us uh, uh, Gazi Yasher Gil. He was a neurosurgeon, and by the way, he was um, uh, chosen by the World Federation of Neurosurgery. Uh, he, was he was nominated for neurosurgeon of the second part of the uh, 20th century because of his very important input in microanatomy of the brain. And uh, he was um, the neurosurgeon who described the different approaches to the uh, circle of Willis, uh, who described the arachnoid plane and the different arachnoid systems that you have to open to go to different regions of the um, uh, circle of Willis. And basically, the modern neurosurgery is the neurosurgery that um, is the micro neurosurgery that he was the first to introduce and to, uh, to explore. Uh, here we can uh, find uh, some illustrations ab about the circle of Willis and mainly about his posterior part. Uh, now I will talk a little bit more in details about the posterior part of the circle of Willis, about the posterior communicating artery. I will name it PCOM, uh, the basilar artery, the P1 and P2 segment of the posterior cerebral artery, and the anatomical variations of, the circle of this part of the circle of Willis. Finally, which I will discuss a little bit more in details, the perforatic branches and the zone of, pe of penetration of these perforatic branches. So we made a study of uh, 35 human cadavers. We used the technique for coloring the arteries. And finally, we had 70 hemispheres that we studied uh, in, uh, with optical magnification of uh, 6 to 40 uh, times. This is the circle of Willis. Uh, I will. Um, this is. Uh, I suppose that you are uh, easily orientated, but I will uh, name the basic structures. This is the optic nerve. This is the internal carotid artery. This is the anterior choroid artery. This is the PCOM uh, artery. This is the posterior cerebral artery with the P1 segment and the P2 segment. This is the third cranial nerve, and here you can find the basilar artery. We have used the nomenclature of ZEO in 1978, and the, the, following this nomenclature, uh, the perforating branches are divided to anterior thalamo perforating branches that are located uh, in the, mainly in the posterior communicating artery. Part of this anterior thalamo perforating branches is the most important one of them, the premamillary artery. And posterior thalamo perforating branches that are mainly from the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery. Regarding the perfusion area, you can, feel, uh, you can find here an illustration of the optic chiasma part of the optic nerve and optic tract, the pituitary gland and hypothalamus, the, the mammillary bodies, and the cerebral peduncles. What are the main variations of the PCOM artery? Usually, we are describing three types of variation, the normal or adult type, the hypoplastic and the fetal type. The normal type is characterized by the fact that the diameter of the, uh, of the PCOM, uh, of, the, uh, ACO, of the anterior communicating, of the posterior communicating, there is a, a mistake here, uh, of the posterior communicating artery is more than one millimeter, the diameter is larger than one millimeter, but is smaller than the diameter of the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery. The hypoplastic is a thin one that is with diameter less than one millimeter, and the fetal type is uh, this type where the, 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 the posterior communicating artery is larger than the P1 segment 
of the, uh, of the posterior cerebral artery. So in our study, the most frequent uh, type of posterior communicating artery was the audio type and the hypoplastic one. The fetal, can, uh, fetal type of uh, posterior communicating artery can be found in about 10-11% uh, of the cases. This is an illustration of the hypoplastic pa, uh, type of uh, PCOM A. Uh, as you can see, this is a very thin diameter, less than one millimeter, and we have uh, uh, this artery with uh, which is uh, with continuously thin diameter, but despite this, we can find an important perforating branch, branch emerging from it. This is the fetal type. As you can see, the posterior communicating artery is with a very important diameter that is much larger than the diameter of the P1 segment of the posterior uh, cerebral artery. As we can see, the P2 segment of the posterior cerebral artery is a directly emerging, is a continuity of the uh, posterior communicating artery. This is the fetal type once again. We see a PCOM A with important diameter uh, that is continuing in the P2 segment of the posterior cerebral artery. What is interesting here that the premammillary pre artery emer is emerging from this P2 segment. This is a very rare and somehow unique uh, uh, case of an anomaly of the posterior cerebral artery that is bifurcating at the end and gives two branches going in the P1 and P2 segment of the, of the posterior cerebral artery. This was not been described previous to our study. So I don't want to go in details uh, with all these uh, numbers, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the length of the posterior communicating artery can vary from 8 to 20 millimeters. In some cases, even 30 millimeters. Uh, the diameter of the anterior third of the artery is larger than the diameter of the second and third uh, part of the artery, which is important regarding some surgical technique permitting the section of this artery, and regarding that the diameter is small in the distal part, usually you have to try to make the dissection of this vessel in the posterior part. Uh, the number of uh, perforating vessels usually is about eight uh, perforating vessels that are emerging from the posterior communicating artery, but the larger number is the, in, in, the, in the first, in the proximal third, and the lesser number is the last, in the distal third. So here, once again, the risk of damaging perforating vessels during this section is less if you do this section in the posterior third. This is the zone of penetration. Uh, these numbers can be interesting for the neurologist, and uh, probably some of them can uh, uh, discuss some of the, um, some of the neurological syndromes uh, depending on the, uh, where the obstruction of the posterior communicating has happened. This is once again a hypoplastic uh, artery, in this case a bilateral hypoplastic artery. You can see that this vessel and this vessel are less than one millimeter. So in conclusion, the hypoplastic posterior communi communicating artery tend to be longer and with more distinct reduction of the diameter from the anterior to the posterior third than the adult type of the posterior communicating artery. The posterior third of the com posterior communicating artery seems to be the area where the risk of damage of perforating vessels during interoperative division is the least. This result was published in uh, Acta Neurochirurgica. Now I will go a little bit more in detail uh, for the premammillary artery, PM artery. The PM artery is usually defined as the largest and most constant perforating branch of the PCOM artery. Here you can see this large and important branch named PM artery. The PM artery is penetrating in the area between the optic tract, between the mammillary bodies, the peduncles, and this, uh, this area is named the paramedian perforate substance. You can see it with number three and in yellow here. Usually we have one premamillary artery, but the, the PMA can be two or even three in uh, about three to five percent of the cases. Um, usually the 
PMA emerged in the middle third of the posterior communicating artery, as you can see in 60%. And the, uh, the PMA emerged only in about 10 to 15% from the posterior, distal third of the uh, posterior communicating artery. We have very rare cases when the PMA emerged from the internal carotid artery, from the P2 segment of the posterior uh, cerebral artery. So this is a classical PMA that is emerging from the from the, from the posterior communicating artery. As you can see, the diameter of the posterior communicating artery before and after the emergence of the PMA is different. So there is a slight reduction of the diameter. Here is another uh, illustration of a very uh, posterior uh, uh, premamillary artery with a very important diameter emerging from a relatively thin posterior communicating artery. So regarding that this vessel is with so important diameter, we can assume that uh, it is very important for the function, one of the most important uh, perforating branches of the posterior communicating artery. This is another illustration of a very important diameter of the PMA emerging from the posterior communicating artery. In some cases, the posterior communicating artery continues in the PMA and only a very thin branches continue to the posterior cerebral artery. As you can see here, we may say that the PMA exists to uh, ensure the blood supply for the PMA. Here was again another installation, the posterior communicating artery continues as a PMA and only very thin branches that ensure the, the, uh, the communication between the anterior and the posterior circulation. This is a very rare case where, where we can see the PMA emerging from the internal carotid artery. This is quite important during surgery if you have to sacrifice some vessels because this may lead to, uh, to uh, this can mislead you that this is a horrid or other type of artery and um, you, you have to, to avoid to be, mislead, to be misled from this anatomical variation. This is another very rare case with the PMA emerging from the P2 segment of the posterior cerebral artery. Once again, uh, PMA, posterior premamillary artery, emerging from the P2 segment of the posterior cerebral artery. Here you can see an endoscopic view of the PMA, and here once again, the posterior cerebral uh, communicating artery, the third cranial nerve, the premamillary artery that is uh, passing through uh, in close proximity to the third cranial nerve, and here are the internal carotid and the A1 segment. So in conclusion, for the, uh, pos uh, for the posterior communicating artery, the typical PMA may be described as the largest and the most constant perforating branch emerging from the anterior or middle third of the PCOM A and reaching the paramedian perforated substance. Finally, I would like to tell a few words about the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery and um, about its perforating branches. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned in the previous study, uh, this, is a, this is a different one, but we studied 19 brains or 30, uh, 38 P1 segments. Only uh, the, the, the fetal type of the posterior communicating artery can be seen in about 15%. Uh, these are the zone of penetration of the perforating vessels of the P1 segment. You can see here that there are a lot uh, of, uh, of uh, perforating vessels emerging from this segment, and they are quite difficult to be described. It is quite difficult uh, to describe them. Uh, what is important that even a single perforating vessel can uh, give, uh, give rise to a lot of uh, a network of smaller perforating branches that are going even bilaterally. This is another illustration that monolateral perforating vessels can ensure the bilateral, uh, bilateral supply in this case of the mammillary bodies. This is another illustration that even a thin, very thin P1 segment, this, as you can see, a fetal type of posterior communicating artery, uh, even a very thin uh, and hypoplastic uh, 
TOR segment may give rise of a very important uh, network of perforating branches. This means that um, the hypoplasty, anatomical hypoplasty, do not mean uh, functional hypoplasty. From this point of view, sacrifice of this type of vessel cannot be t uh, is a tough decision and uh, have to be taken very carefully. So, in conclusion, the diameter of the posterior communicating artery and the PUR segment are reciprocal. Same rule is valid for their perforating branches. The first perforators emerge about one millimeter distal, distal of the basilar artery bifurcation. This is important for surgery because in this region we have to put our clips and as this is important also for endovascular because uh, in, uh, up, uh, the, the secure region is only one millimeter apart, the, the basilar artery bifurcation. Finally, the perforatus, perforatus uh, the perforating branches of the uh, PUR segment usually penetrates unilaterally, but sometimes this may be a bilateral perfusion. A few words about the infundibular dilatation of the posterior communicating artery, which is regarded as a pre aneurysmal uh, state from some authors. It can be seen in uh, about 17% of the cases. In some cases, they can be really a pre aneurysmal state because, uh, as you can see here, some kind of uh, microaneurysm has started to be formed. Uh, the shape of the, pre of the infundibular dilatation is very important. If it is triangular, as in this case, we may assume that it will not evolve, uh, we will not expect an evolution in an, an, uh, in an aneurysm. But if we can see this shape, a shape like this, a more oval, a more uh, spheric one, uh, it's very probable uh, to have, uh, that we may expect an evolution in direction of aneurysm formation. So finally, this is a bilateral infundibular dilatation of both posterior clicating arteries. And in conclusion, hypoplastic posterior communicating artery tend to be longer and with more distinct reduction of the diameter from the anterior to the posterior distal third than the adult type of the posterior communicating artery. The posterior third of the posterior communicating artery seems to be the area where the risk of uh, damage of perforating vessels during intraoperative division is the least. Premammillary artery may be described as the largest and the most constant perforating branch emerging from the anterior or middle third of the posterior communicating artery and reaching the paramedian perforate substance. The diameters of the posterior communicating artery and the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral artery are reciprocal. Same rule is valid for their perforating branches. The first perforators emerge about one millimeter distal to the basilar artery bifurcation. The perforators usually penetrate unilaterally. And finally, a few uh, words about the new methods of investigation of the circle of Willis. Of course, this is the CT and MRI angio that uh, gave us the possibility to make um, diagnostic non-invasively. So actually, we are preferring as a first step these methods. I want to mention also the mathem mathemat mathematical modeling, uh, which is very important to, to assess the tension in the different part of the circle of Willis, which, as we know, is important regarding the uh, aneurysmal formation. So the hemodynamic hem stress is important for the uh, formation of aneurysm, and this type of calculation can give us a good idea if um, some regions uh, suffer from more stress than other. Uh, finally, something that is uh, relatively new, this is the printing of 3D models, 3D printing, that give us the possibility, uh, uh, of course, not only for the purpose of education, but also for the pre-operative uh, assessment, uh, to make... Um, to make a 3D model of the circle of Willis and to assess um, preoperatively the positioning, the exact positioning of the, uh, of the cerebral aneurysm and to assess what are the clips that we need, uh, what can we expect from the collateral flow, etc. So this is a new and interesting tool. Uh, the circle of Willis uh, in the era of neuroendovascular treatment, uh, well, probably you, uh, 
you can tell us more than more for, on this topic. But uh, regarding the recent publication, the main importance of the circle wheel is, is that it can be used for a collateral access during uh, treatment of difficult uh, uh, aneurysms and AVMs. So this is uh, the timeline of the evolution of our knowledge and the evolution of the concepts. Everything started some uh, 150 years ago with the concept of Galen that was stopping, uh, that was um, revolutionary for, for its time, but uh, was stopping the development uh, of the knowledge uh, uh, some thousand, uh, 1,200 uh, years later. Uh, we have to mention all the scientists that step-by-step step, uh, made uh, breakthrough, uh, break, breakthrough in these Galen concepts uh, by uh, Mm, the work of uh, William Harvey, who uh, described the heart to work as uh, a pump. Um, of course, Thomas Willis, who made a thorough illustration and description of the function of the circle of, of Willis, and all the following uh, scientists that gave us the contemporary knowledge and contemporary concepts about the circle of Willis and the uh, brain circulation. So, um, if we have to make a general conclusion about the circle of Willis, uh, we have to tell that this is the most common place of aneurysm formation. Uh, this is uh, the, the circle of Willis is an important for the collateral flow of the brain and for reduction of the hemodynamic stress of the arteries of the brain. The perforating vessels of the circle of Willis have to be preserved during surgery or during endovascular procedure. Some part of the circle of Willis can be sacrificed during surgery if the collateral flow of the per and the perforating vessels are preserved. The circle of Willis can be an important alternative for access during endovascular procedures. And uh, finally, the mathematical modeling of the non-invasive uh, and the non-invasive image studies will be the basis for our future understanding about the circle of Willis. Thank you for your attention. Um, okay, now we open the floor to questions. Infundibular dilatation of dilatation of uh, income uh, is uh, the wall is, is, is small wall and it's is pre aneurysm or no? What do you think? I think that the most important part is the shape of uh, this um, uh, infundibular dilatation. Is if it is a triangular, more a tri tri triangular one. Uh, I think that this is not really a pre-aneurysmal uh, state. But if it becomes more or less spheric, this can be measured with different angles. And uh, after a certain angle, I think that we have to consider it as a pre-aneurysmal state. But basically, if it's triangular shape, it's okay. If, if it is a spheric shape, it's not okay. Thank you.